Welcome folks, it's Nick here. For those of you who don't know, I've recently-ish returned from a solo motorcycling trip around Europe, lasting about six weeks, covering six and a half thousand miles, eleven and a half thousand kilometers, through 21 countries or so. Camping where I could, hoteling, hosteling, or guest house when I didn't. So camping was about a third of the time. And that trip has led me to have some lessons learned that I really thought I'd like to share with you. So along with those lessons learned, I've also got some thoughts and observations about the whole, the whole journey, which I'll also cover. The areas I'll cover in this video are the importance of a shakedown or stroke trial run, routes and route planning, accommodation, avoiding putting all your eggs in one basket, paying for things, travelling solo as I did or in groups, keeping in contact and making contact whilst you're away, vlogging if that floats your boat and probably most importantly the enjoyment factor of going on any motorcycle ride especially a trip and lastly what I did and what I do mean by all about the journey which was a theme that ran through my series of Big Trip, all about the journey. First of all, I want to cover the importance of a shakedown run. Effectively a trial run, if you are going on a larger trip. You want to make sure that you're prepared for it. Not just that the, the bike is capable of doing the journey you want from a, a size and engine capacity wise. But it's of a fit state to do that journey. Has it been serviced regularly or serviced recently I should say? Or essential maintenance? Are there any defects that you need to consider? So the usual type of thing. But also, based on the luggage that you're taking, can you secure the luggage sufficiently? If you're taking camping gear, then you're going to need more storage, obviously. Make sure that you've got the right racks mounted, panniers, etc. The reason I say this is that I did do a shakedown run on my prior to my trip and determined that the tent and the sleeping mat I was taking weren't up to the job and I also changed the luggage arrangement only to find that on the third day of my trip due to the extra size, not huge, but there was an extra size element to the tent and the sleeping mat that I burnt a hole on the exhaust of a soft pannier which destroyed the tarp that was in that pannier and then caused a bit of grief for the rest of the trip but that's another story and that's because I didn't do another shakedown run having done the replacements so the importance is is real and if it's not your first trip then maybe everything is the same as the last one and you don't need to do it but that's your decision The shakedown run also allows you to identify those areas or those top items which are essential or I wish I'd brought. I'm glad I brought because those sort of items. Items which are nice to have and by having them makes you feel more comfortable. Then take them. If you can re reduce anxiety for anything then do it. It's your trip after all. You've got room for it. 
and those items which are completely luxury don't take the kitchen sink. And what I'd like to add there is clothing wise don't take too much. I took some wicking type t-shirts which dry really quickly. I took some wicking boxer shorts again they dry quickly. Ankle socks dry really quickly rather than sort of like half calf length socks can save a lot of time and effort easy enough to clean you don't need to take hundreds of these things just uh, take a cycle and I also took some trousers which zip off at the knee so they doubled up as sort of shorts or long trousers again they were of a material that dried very quickly and I could put them on the back of the bike strapped by a cargo net in a little vented bag and they dried incredibly quickly. I also took some shoes because I intended doing some walking so flip-flops wouldn't cut it for that. All in all, shakedown run, trial run is just that. Have I taken what I want to take, which is reasonable and isn't just superfluous to my needs. The next topic is routes and route planning. You may want to plan your route to the nth degree before you go. And that's fine if you do, just be aware that there will be times when you need to take a detour. And if it makes you feel more comfortable then, then do that. You can book your accommodation in advance as well. I was lucky for route planning, one of the subscribers, Lajos, provided me with a, a route of about 2,000 kilometers, which beautiful route. So thank you for that, Lajos. The rest of it, though, I either planned myself or winged it and let uh, Garmin Satnav do it for me. Which is also something you should consider in your shakedown run. The method of navigation are you going to be using a GPS device, dedicated GPS like a Garmin Zumo XT as I have, your phone, paper maps, memory, whatever it might be, test it out in the test it out in the shakedown run. Make sure that you understand the technology, whatever that might be, even if it's a paper map and a compass. And what to do if it fails. Whichever method you use, do try and allow time in your trip to visit places and see places. For my trip, I was sort of getting it out of my system my first big solo trip, six weeks, I'd never done that before. Camping, hadn't done that since I was a teenager. And just uh, allow time to stop and enjoy. Factor that into your journey. The journey might be shorter mileage wise, but you're adding to it the, the overall rounded experience. And that's a huge lesson learned for my next trip. I was very happy to cover 21 countries in those six weeks, but there are places that I could have stopped at, should have stopped at maybe. I don't regret not stopping, but they're a long way to go and visit again. I did factor in a couple of days here and there. So I stopped in Dubrovnik for a, a few days and Prague, etc. But really I could have done with some more. One other item I want to add is that on your route planning you may well factor in restaurant stops only to find depending on the time of year that you're there especially with the pandemic having run for a couple of years that those restaurants are no longer there so just go with the flow 
if you need to take a detour, especially if you're riding solo, then do. If you want to stop, then do. I did find that a lot of places were shut for lunch after two o'clock. So bear that in mind, 12 till two seemed to be the sweet spot. And while we're talking about eating and stops, a few words about accommodation. I used a combination of Booking.com and Google Maps for my accommodation. Booking.com was used for hotels, guest houses, etc. And what I tended to do was ride until sort of five o'clock in the evening or until I was getting close to being ready for to pack up for the day. And then look on booking.com for an appropriate guest house or hotel, preferably with parking, in a distance that I could quite happily make that evening. And that's what I did. With camping, be aware that although in Scotland you are allowed to wild camp, in England you're not. And I don't know about many of the other countries that I travelled through, so I always booked a site, which meant you had to book in advance, typically by about three o'clock, otherwise people didn't answer the phone or anything, and you could get to a site where the gate is locked. So you can't get in. So just be aware of that one. But accommodation overall, in Europe at least, seemed to range for the prices I paid anywhere between 21 euros for a, a hotel up to about 80 euros. So it, it does vary. Hence I chose camping, but of course that did mean I'm carrying an awful lot of luggage just for the, the camping bit. Cost-wise, I think it's paid for itself, so I've now got the camping gear that I can reuse on my next trips. But if I wasn't planning a next trip, then I don't think it would have been worthwhile. Let's talk about not putting all your eggs in one basket. From personal experience, I made the mistake of putting all my GoPro batteries spare batteries that is, and Camp Park action camera batteries in one bag, which was very, very convenient. And that bag had been attached to my tank bag with a zip. Because of other reasons, I needed extra space. That's because I burnt a hole in my luggage and needed a bit more room. I removed that bag and stuffed it inside the tank bag. As you might have guessed, I lost that bag with all my batteries in and that caused me some anxiety for the next few days because I couldn't uh, do my YouTubing stuff. And you would think that buying a GoPro battery in Europe would be an easy thing, but it wasn't. I couldn't find one. I did find some alternatives, but it was almost a week later before I, I managed to find them. And then I paid a premium for a set of batteries which I don't think are, are great but anyway so they may that may not happen to you but just bear in mind things like credit cards if you've got all your payment methods all in one place and you lose that payment method you're scuppered so just be aware of that which takes us nicely into our next point which is about paying for things. Don't assume that you can pay for things with cash or with card everywhere you go. That applies in the UK, around Europe, and I'm sure around the world. In UK, we're a bit spoiled. They tend to take cards here for very small amounts. But in other places I went to, it was cash only, including 
campsites and a couple of the hotels that I booked through booking.com. I thought I'd paid for those on card but no that was just a security deposit. I had to pay cash when I got there in local currency. And because I was going through 21 different countries I never quite knew what currency I would need. But it is worth having some local currency especially for small items like bottles of water and light snacks. You can't really expect to pop into a corner shop and pay 35 or 40 cents for a bottle of water on a card. Uh, they wouldn't take it, so you have to have some cash to do that. Some places would take euros, but at a very dodgy rate I'm sure. And you can buy water and snacks at most petrol stations. And that's what I did when I topped up with petrol. I would buy some more water and snacks. The next topic is a big one. Travelling solo, as I did, or travelling in groups. This is a personal choice that, as individuals, we all have to make. You can listen to the pros and cons, but it's not until you do it yourself that you'll, you'll really know. The reason I travelled solo on this trip was it gave me the greatest flexibility. I could choose to plan a route, deviate from that route at will, go left instead of right or whatever it might be, ride longer that day, start later that day, stop and take a photograph, not stop at that place for a photograph, stop and have a snack, take as long as I liked for the snack. So I had all that flexibility because I was on my own. In a group, you're dependent on keeping to a schedule as such. You all have to leave at a certain time and you ride until a certain time. All stop at petrol or somebody wants to take a photograph or needs to stop for some other reason, everybody has to stop. So from a selfish perspective, that's why I chose going solo. There are some downsides. There was nobody to chat to about the ride that we'd just done at the end of the day. But coincidentally, I've just met a couple in Bybury and they were saying that they'd been on a group tour recently and they got a bit bored with the endless discussion about the motorcycle ride they'd just done that day. So, you, you know, it's, it pays your money, it takes your choice, I guess. However, although I was riding solo, and didn't ride specific routes with anybody. It didn't stop me chatting with people. And I could talk to them in the evenings, especially at campsites. For example, I met a couple from the UK who cycled down into Croatia over a few week period and were on their way to, I think it was Uzbekistan. So there's nothing to stop you chatting. Which of course leads into the next topic, which is about keeping in touch, in contact and making contact whilst you're away. So one is important, especially if you're traveling solo, and especially, especially if you're traveling in remote places, keep in touch with people at home, let them know that you're safe family or friends, it's good to chat with them, especially on a longer trip. It's nice to have that conversation. But making contact as well. Don't be afraid to speak to people, even in foreign languages. I had a fantastic conversation with an Albanian lady who ran a guest house I was staying in. We just used Google Translate. I had my phone, she had her phone. I'd type something She'd listen to what I'd typed, and then she'd type something back. We didn't try conversation mode, but it worked very well, and we had a great conversation for maybe half an hour or an hour. No. It was great. Also, don't be afraid to ask for help. Again, even if it's in a foreign language, 
The likes of Google Translate on phones is great and quite often you don't even need to use words. I came across a number of road closures. Locals could see my dilemma because the road was just shut, completely blocked off, no way through, no direction, no diversion signs and no idea how to get round this thing. Even with the, the Garmin, sat now for him using a dedicated device, but the locals would see my dilemma and help me along my way. Hey. Oh. Oh, okay. Okay. And in one place in, in Greece, I needed to find a motorcycle shop. I chatted to somebody at a traffic light asking him, did he know where it was in English? just a few words, it turns far that he spoke very good English and took me there. I would never have found it without him. It's about uh, three, four minutes from here. Don't, don't go out of your way. No, 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 don't worry. Thank you. So, you know, make contact and keep in touch with people. Keep in contact. Enjoy that part of the journey. So one item that might be of interest to some of you is vlogging. I'd never done a video log before. Had no idea. I thought you just got a camera and stuck it up on YouTube and that was it. But do not underestimate the time it takes to edit videos. I Make sure that you have in mind the topic that you want to cover and make sure you cover it. Make sure your microphone is picking up what you're saying. Make sure it's not at some jaunty angle like 45 degrees, which it was quite often. I had all sorts of problems with my microphone. Probably my fault and a non-matching microphone. I'm now using a purple panda. I hope this is working better. But because I prattled on and waffled on, the end of a day, I might have upwards of 80 clips to go through 40 gig of data. It took hours because some of those clips I would refer to something I'd said earlier so I couldn't just skip them and some of them the sound didn't come out or the video was at an angle. So my lessons learned there are don't underestimate it and also just trying to find places to upload videos I ran very far behind but something I can highly recommend is keeping a daily journal I kept a paper-based journal just something cheap off of Amazon it worked a treat there was space for me to put the date what time I set off uh, what the weather was like how much fuel I used things I saw during the day etc and it's marvellous because I've now got that record over the 40 days that I travelled of when did I see those five bears, for example. On the plus side of vlogging though, something I must call out was I had no appreciation at all of what a great community there is out there. I had no idea that people would actually watch my videos. And when they did, they commented and they're so encouraging. There's observations, recommendations, areas for improving, offers of help. It was just fabulous. But it's, it's also a fantastic feeling when somebody comments that you've inspired them to take a trip. So I'm obviously not a young man, but Whilst you can, go and do these things, enjoy them to the fullest. And vlogging, <laughs> although it's a bit of a pain in the butt, it's opened my eyes to a, a whole world of fellow motorcyclists out there that other, I otherwise would never have met.
And so on to what I think is the most important of these lessons learned or thoughts or observations and comments. You see, I'm hoping that you're doing this trip for leisure. However long or short it is, if you're motorcycling for leisure, enjoy the ride. Make the most of it. There will be ups and downs, literally, and, and mentally, there will be challenges along the way, I'm sure. But just surprise yourself with how well you can cope with these things. So yes, there will be roads closed. Yes, you will lose your GoPro batteries or whatever it might be. Just go with the flow. Enjoy it. I had a real fun time on my journey. It may not have always shown it, because some of the videos, especially the early ones, f focused more on the downside, because it did rain a lot every afternoon, down downpours. I did lose my batteries, I did burn my panniers. So it just didn't look as if I was having as much fun as I actually did, but overall it was absolutely marvellous. This is a really pretty little place, Ducklington it's called. I'm very tempted to just go round again. Look at these places. And because I'm riding solo, I can do that if I so desire. Or not, as the case may be. Let's continue and see what's further up. As I was saying, because I'm riding solo, I can just turn round and go and have a look at this place again. It's really pretty. Ducklington in Oxfordshire. The last point I wanted to cover was the theme that ran through my, I think it's 36 episodes, was all about the journey. And what did I mean, what do I mean by all about the journey? Very briefly, it's more than just the physical scenery, how did the motorbike behave and handle, um, what were the people like, those sort of questions. It was about the journey, the exploration, not only of yourself, but of places too. Look at this church here, just interrupting myself. It's lovely. I'd never been on such a long journey and riding solo. I hadn't been camping since I was a teenager. So all those were new to me. I hadn't done vlogging, so that was new to me as well. I hadn't used the navigation system that I'm using now. So it was all new, all learnings. And my journey really has been one of what I hope, I don't mean it to be a cliche of growth, because when did the things did go wrong, I had to rely on myself, but I have the confidence to ask others for help in a foreign language, or sign language, and that worked out well too. My journey therefore was one of personal growth I hope, and preparing me for not just my next motorcycle trip, although I've learned a lot to take forward to that one, but also about how to handle stuff in life in general. I hope you found something of use in this video. If you do, or if you have, please leave a like. Add your comments, I'll try and get back to them as soon as I can. And all that leaves me to say is bye for now.